Well, thank you, Jen. Those are good words for us tonight, aren't they? In fact, would you look around and just meet eyes with someone at a different table and, and just look at them and, and, and let them know you're looking at them and tell them Jesus loves you, okay? Do, do it for three people, okay? I love that. I love that we're here together. <laughs> Isn't that a great thing? Thanks for coming out tonight in the cold on Valentine's Day. And for those of you joining us online, hello. We're glad that you're with us too. Yeah, good to be here. I'm hoping that we're getting to the end of some of this kind of silliness and that there won't be that question every month. Are we in person or are we online? No, we're here in person, and I'm so glad, so glad you're here. So I was thinking... Um, since we haven't gotten to see enough snow in the last couple weeks, right? <laughs> I found some funny snow pictures, and I just had to share them with you. Um, how much snow do you think we have out there? Would you say it's maybe like about two feet? <laughs> I thought that was kind of clever. <laughs> and then I saw this one. I thought, man, whoever did this one, They definitely have the day off school or off work, right? <laughs> Maybe the week off. I'm really glad my kids never saw that picture when they, were <laughs> when they were teenagers. I think I would have been in trouble. So then this one, when I saw this one, I thought, is that maybe like a snow woman event at Latte? <laughs> but then when I looked at it closer, I thought, I don't know, some of those faces look kind of angry. <laughs> I hope it's not Latte. Maybe it's like the Bengals fans at the Super Bowl last night. <laughs> that made me sad. Um, and then our last one, this is one that I wish I had thought of when our kids were little. Isn't that so creative? I would love to have done that with our kids. Okay, I said that was our last one, but it's not actually really our last one. There's one more, and this one, this one that you're going to see in a second, it's, it's the cutest snowman picture you've ever seen, I feel really sure. Okay, you ready? Here we go. That's my little grandbaby, Teddy. <laughs> I had to find a way to get him up there. <laughs> we were just FaceTiming a little while ago. He's so fun. <laughs> it's kind of awkward, you know, when you FaceTime with a six-month-old because, like, they don't, <laughs> they don't really have a whole lot to say back. <laughs> so I'm like, hi, Teddy, peekaboo. <laughs> it's fun. All right. Um, a theme that I've seen over the years is I've had a chance to visit with a lot of different women. In fact, I was having two conversations just recently, two different conversations, two different women. And, and, and that theme kind of emerged, and it was this. These women were saying that they feel like their lives are just kind of mundane. And they kind of wonder, like, like what? I, I'm not really doing anything big with my life. What is, what is God's purpose for me? What's God's purpose for my life? I wonder if you've ever felt that way. Like, like, what does my life count for? You know, you wake up in the morning, you go to work again, or you go to school again, or you stay with the kids all day again, <laughs> or maybe you're retired. Whatever your season of life, what difference am I making? What is God's purpose for me? So tonight we're going to look at, at a statement that Jesus made, and then we're going to kind of unpack that and see how that relates to what's What's my purpose in life? What's your, your purpose in life? Now, you know, this year at Latte, every month we're looking at a different woman, right? And, and tonight we get a bonus because we're going to meet two women tonight. So double, double, your, double your, your reward for coming out to Latte tonight. We don't know a whole lot about these women. Their names are Lois and Eunice. Lois and Eunice, they're in the Bible. And we don't know much about them. And actually, that's kind of what I like about them. The Bible doesn't tell us a whole lot about them. And, and, and I, think, I think I'm inspired by that because they don't really do anything dramatic. But they're remembered for something very important in the Bible. And so we're going to look tonight at how they live their lives honoring the Lord just in the everyday. Just in the everyday of life. So if you ever wondered what God's purpose is for you, I hope that you're going to be encouraged by what we're going to see tonight. I've been encouraged as I've been studying and preparing for tonight. So you know our theme this year is Uncommon Courage. And every month we're, we're looking at another 
woman from the Bible, and we're being encouraged by her life. Did you ever think about that in the middle of that word encouragement, I never really noticed this before, right in the middle of that word is the word courage. So we're being encouraged, we're being given courage by these women from the Bible. Often I think when we think of that word courage, we think about amazing things, right? I, I tried to find a visual online. What's a visual for courage? And here's the, here's the image that just kept popping up again and again and again. This. Really? It's a, I mean, it's a great photo, right? But it's not something you're ever going to see me doing. <laughs> it's big. It's adventurous. It's scary. It's not something I'm going to do. <laughs> if that's courage, I'm in trouble. But that's what kept popping up. And, and here's what I think. I think that really courage it's not always the big, adventurous, scary things. It's the, it's the nitty-gritty of everyday life being lived out in everyday life, the mundane, everyday choices, not the impressive, big cliff jumping. I looked up the word courage, and here's what Webster told me, that it's the mental or moral strength to persevere, to just keep going persevere. Some days it takes a lot of courage just to get out of bed in the morning. Am I right? Some mornings it takes a lot of courage just to get up and face another day. So here's a question for you. What inspires you to get out of bed in the morning? Think about that for a minute. What inspires you to get out of bed in the morning? So here's my favorite answer. You ready? Here it is. Anybody else there? Yeah, that's why I get out of bed in the morning. <laughs> Sometimes way earlier than I want to, too. <laughs> Some mornings, don't, don't you kind of feel like this guy here? It's kind of a fuzzy picture. I couldn't find a clear one. But don't you feel like getting out of bed in the morning is like facing all kinds of hard things that are coming at you? No wonder we want to just roll over and pull those covers back up, right? But the bladder calls, so <laughs> we got to get up. So we're going to see tonight that it's actually a noble thing to get out of bed in the morning. It's a noble thing to face another day, to, to be pleasing to the Lord. We, we don't have to necessarily do what others might call great things because it's a noble thing just to get up in the morning and face another day. Uncommon courage, I think, really shows up in the little things. And sometimes I think it's the little things that really are the great things. Does that make sense? It's the little things that really are the great things. So here's what Jesus said. He said, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. That's the first and the greatest commandment. And the second one is just as important, to love your neighbor as yourself. We've talked before at Latte about how as we follow the Lord, there are different dimensions, right? There's that vertical dimension. Love the Lord with all you are. And then love people around you. The, the vertical and the horizontal. I find it interesting that that, that makes a, a cross. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. And love the people around you. It, it's a noble thing to get out of bed in the morning and to live a life of love for God and love for for people. So I hope when you leave here tonight, you're going to be encouraged. Let's get to know Lois and Eunice. Here's what the Apostle Paul writes about Lois and Eunice. In the, it's in the part of the Bible we call Timothy. And you know, if you're familiar with the Bible, if you're not familiar with the Bible, it's a, it's a big book, 66 different parts, and they each have names. And so we're going to look at the part called Timothy. And it's called that because it was a, it's two letters that the Apostle Paul wrote to a man named Timothy. So we call it 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy. So Paul writes this letter to this fella. I know you're excited I'm drawing, right? <laughs> Paul writes letters to this guy, Timothy. We'll give him a little bit of hair here and some eyes. Ooh, that eye's way bigger than the other one. Yikes, don't know how to fix that. So we'll give him a smile and his name, Timothy. So Paul is writing to this guy, Timothy. And here's what he says to him. He says, Timothy, I am reminded of your sincere faith, 
which first lived in your grandmother, Eun Lois, and then in your mother, Eunice. So we've got Timothy, and then we've got the grandmother over here. Let's see. I don't necessarily think women should always wear dresses, but I don't know how else to differentiate. So we're just going to put her in a dress here, or maybe it's a house coat. I don't know. And we'll give her some curly hair. And should we give her glasses? Because she's okay. Here's Lois. Put some eyes in there. Okay. So the grandmother Lois. And then the mother, Eunice. And let's see here. We'll give her some curls. All right. And her name is Eunice. So we got Timothy, his mom, Eunice, and his grandma, Lois. And Paul says, Timothy, I'm reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother, Lois, and also in your mother, Eunice. A couple things stand out to me. First is this. Timothy has a sincere faith. He has a sincere faith. And it seems to be related to the fact, because Paul says, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, it seems to be related to the fact that his mom and grandma also had a sincere faith. That kind of stands out to me. So I had to ask myself, what does it mean to have a sincere faith? What does it mean when Paul says, I'm reminded of your sincere faith? The word... Originally, you know, the New Testament was written in Greek. And so sometimes I think it's helpful to go back and say, okay, what, is, what did that word mean originally? So the, so the word for sincere in the original Greek, I'm not going to try to say it, but you'll see it up here on the screen. And here's what it meant. It meant without wax. So, so you see that pot there has a crack in it. So what they could have done is they could have taken the special wax they had and they could have filled in that crack and then, and then covered over it and made it look like that pot didn't have a crack, but they didn't do that because this is a, this is a sincere pot, right? It's, it's as it is. It's not trying to look like something it's not. It's not pretending to be perfect. It's a broken pot. That's what it is. It's a sincere pot. Other translations translate that word genuine, unfeigned, unhypocritical, without play acting, without playing the part being the same person at home that they are in public, being the same person when the camera isn't looking as they are when pictures are being taken for social media. Sincere. This is who I am. I'm real. I'm sincere. That's what the word is communicating. Some of you know that my husband's parents were, um, they were the first pastoral couple here at Grace Church many years ago, and Jonathan will often talk about his parents, and here's something that he'll say about them quite often, is that they were the same people at home that they were at church, that they were people of integrity, like, not that they were perfect by any means, but they weren't pretending. They, they lived in humility before the Lord in public, and they lived in humility before the Lord at home. They were the same people. They were, they were sincere. There was no pretense. And Jonathan's the same way. He's what you see here at church is the same, same person he is in private. Sincere, without wax, genuine, authentic. Lois and Eunice had a sincere faith. I think that's beautiful. The next thing I had to ask myself was this. They had a sincere faith. We looked at what is sincere, but what does it mean to have a sincere faith specifically? What does that mean, that they had a sincere faith? Well, again, the Greek word, you'll see that up here on the, on the screen. It means to be persuaded, to come to trust. It's more than just like believing something. You know, people will say, oh, yeah, I have faith. Oh, yeah, I believe in God. That's not what this word means. This word means being completely persuaded, so much so that you put your trust in. That's what this word means. So it wasn't just that Lois and Eunice believed in God. They had sincere faith. They had learned about Jesus. They had been convinced that he was who he claimed to be, and they had put their trust in him. Their faith was real. 
not just like a religion, not just a list of do's and don'ts, but they had put their trust in Jesus and, and dedicated their lives to following him. That happened to me when I was in college. I didn't grow up understanding all the stuff about who Jesus is, and someone told me that I should read the Bible. So I was like, okay. So I started reading. And as I was reading, I remember one night I was reading, I was actually house-sitting for someone. They were out of town. I was there by myself and reading, and I was underlining in red pen. A and I came to this part, and it was like lights came on for me, and I was like, wait, wait. So, so God loves me. Jesus died for me. I can have a relationship with God. It's, there's more to this than just like going to church. I, I didn't understand that before that night. But when the lights came on, man, I, I was convinced. I put my trust in. And, and, and I prayed. I didn't even know really how to pray. I just said, hey, God, if you can do anything with me, I'm all yours. And, man, I tell you, my life began to change from the inside out. That's what sincere faith does. It, it changes you. I have some plants in my house. Anybody here have a really green thumb? A couple people. Mine is not very green, so I have plants, but they usually don't, <laughs> they usually don't last very long. <laughs> but I've got some. All my plants are real, except, except this little guy right here. He sits up on my windowsill in my, uh, in my kitchen. I, I think he's kind of cute, but, but I have to tell you, this plant is a hypocrite. I mean, it sits there looking real, but it is fake. It's an imitation. My real plants, they, 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 they grow and they, they take in carbon dioxide and they let off oxygen. They're alive. This little guy, he's just fake. I mean, he just sits there. No value. He just catches dust. It's really hard to dust those little places in there. He's a fake little plant. He's a little hypocrite. No value. There's a big difference between genuine and not. These two women here, they were the real deal. They were genuine. They were alive. They were growing. They were life-giving. They had, they had faith that was changing them. Next thing I notice is this, that their sincere faith lived in them. Their sincere faith lived in them. The Greek word has a connotation of it dwelt in them, and it dwelt in them in such a way that it, that it affected who they were. It influenced them. When faith lives in us, it's obvious. It shows. So how does it show? Well, if you flip over a few more pages in the, in the book of 2 Timothy, you find out this. You find out that Lois and Eunice were committed to the word of God. They were committed to this book. And I think a lot of people think that having faith means knowing a lot about the Bible. Can I tell you, being a person of sincere faith does not necessarily mean that you know everything about this book, that your theology is, is you know, well-developed and you can have all these theological conversations. It doesn't necessarily mean that you know how to do all the right religious things. The Pharisees had all that, and Jesus was not very impressed. Having a sincere faith is not just knowing a lot of stuff. Having a sincere faith is being completely surrendered to the Lord and becoming more like Jesus. Completely surrendered and become. So, so I like this distinction. It's not just about reading the Bible. It's about letting the Bible read you. See the difference? It's not just about reading the Bible. It's about letting the Bible read me. Letting God shine his searchlight into my heart and to say, okay, Mary, that little area of your heart right there, you've not given that to me. And I love you, and I want what's best for you. And so I'm asking you, would you, would you surrender that to me? And, and, and it gives me the opportunity to say, of course, Lord, you love me more than anything. Of course I'm going to surrender that to you too. So it's letting the Bible read me, letting the Spirit search my heart to make me more like Jesus. Having a sincere faith is all about becoming more and more like Christ, the one who's gentle and humble and who's all about 
serving other people instead of trying to get other people to to serve me. It's in inviting the Spirit to, to live in us and produce in us. You know what happens when the Spirit of God lives within us and has freedom to do what he wants to do in us? You know what happens? Here's what happens. Things begin to be produced in our lives. Things like love and joy and peace. You're going to recognize these if you've been around the Bible for a little while. The fruit of the Spirit, love and joy and peace and patience and kindness. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and faithfulness, and self-control. As the Spirit makes his home inside of us, he begins to produce all of these things in us. Having a sincere faith that lives in us means that we fall in love with the Lord so much that his spirit bubbles out of us, that, that, that he overflows from our lives. Remember, remember Jesus' words, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind. That's the first and greatest commandment. And the second one is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. Sincere love shows, it, it overflows in love and joy and peace. I overheard a conversation recently, and uh, so <laughs> my friend and I, we're, we're real committed. We're not going to gossip about people, so we don't ever, you know, talk about people with their names if it's something that could be negative, and we don't ever give, like, details that could. So here's how we, I'm going to tell you this story the way I would tell my friend. Okay, you ready? So exhibit A, <laughs> this person, exhibit A, here's what happened, had, had put a lot of time and energy into planning this event, and, and the event had gone pretty well, but exhibit B, didn't really like how that event went. And so exhibit B came to exhibit A. I'm listening to this conversation between these two. And exhibit B started telling exhibit A how they could have done things better. And I'm listening, I guess eavesdropping <laughs> on their conversation. And just from what I could hear, it sounded to me like exhibit B's ideas didn't really make a whole lot of sense. But So I'm listening, and, and, uh, and I thought exhibit B was being pretty insensitive to exhibit A. So the conversation goes on, and, and I'm thinking, hmm, there are a couple ways this conversation could go. And uh, eventually, after Exhibit B had said a lot of what I thought were pretty insensitive things, I thought, how is Exhibit A going to respond? Because I think I, I was feeling in myself like I would have been like, fine, you plan it next time. <laughs> you know, that kind of like defensive, like, okay then. But here's what Exhibit A did. Exhibit A listened really patiently and then asked a few clarifying questions, you know, and Exhibit B kept talking, talking, talking about, about you know, her ideas. And, and after all, it was really interesting. As Exhibit B talked, she started to realize that her ideas weren't that good after all, <laughs> that they really wouldn't have worked after all. It, it was fascinating to watch. And, and in the end, it all ended well and and uh, Exhibit B was happy with how things had gone and gotten all the thoughts out. And Exhibit A had just been so gracious and kind and patient. And I listened to this, and, and I made a mental note for myself. That's how I want to handle that kind of conversation. I want the Spirit of God to overflow so much in my life that even when I feel attacked, even when I feel like someone is being insensitive to me, that my response would be not like defensiveness, and, but that my response would be gentle and patient and loving like this person. Not retaliating, just loving. It was a sincere faith living in this person, producing the fruit of the Spirit, patience and kindness and gentleness. So sincere faith is not just like a little compartmentalized, like little part of us. You know, we, we go to church on Sunday and that's where our faith is. No, it, it transforms all of who we are and it affects all of what we do. Lois and Eunice had a faith that was sincere. It transformed their lives. If you lived in the neighborhood with Lois and Eunice, 
you would know that there's something different about that. If they worked in your workplace, you'd see the way they interacted with other people, and you'd say, there's something about them. If you watched them with their kids, you'd say, wow, look at that. It, it, it would make a difference. Their faith would make a difference in the way that they interacted with people. So can I say, sometimes it's in the tough circumstances of life that our faith can shine the brightest. I want you to imagine with me for a minute that you've never seen a citrus fruit. All right, you've never seen a lemon or a lime or a grapefruit or any of those things. Never seen one before. And someone comes up to you and they hand you an orange. Okay, so, so you've got this in your hand and you're like, I don't know what this is. You can see it. You can see what size it is, right? The color, you can feel it. But you don't know what's in it because you've never seen a citrus fruit before. So then the person tells you, put a little bit of pressure on that orange. So you squeeze it a little bit, and what happens? Oh, oranges are so fabulous, aren't they? They smell so good. When you put some pressure on there, you start to find out a little bit about that orange. Then you put a little bit more pressure on there. Then you really find out what's in that orange, right? But you don't know it until that orange comes under some pressure, under some stress. And I really think that's what it's like for people, right? It's when we go through those really difficult times that we find out how beautiful is the faith we have. I've seen it. I've seen it with a lot of you, actually, as I'm looking around. You've been through some really hard things. But your faith has been so beautiful. You've inspired me. I've watched you walk through tough things. And, and I don't want you to hear some, at me saying something that I'm not saying. I'm not saying that when we go through tough things, we should just, you know, smile and be happy. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying when, when we go through those tough times, when we have faith in the Lord, we know that he's with us, that he's carrying us through, and it just changes our perspective. I've, wa I've watched you do it. It's a beautiful thing when faith is sincere and real. So today is Valentine's Day, in case you didn't hear, which I think you all did because I see so much red out there. Today is Valentine's Day, and I am guessing that Valentine's Day would have been a pretty tough day for Eunice. I'm guessing it would have been a hard day. It's a hard day for a lot of people, right, like Jen was saying before. I know um, people who would like to be married and are not, people who've lost a spouse either to death or to divorce. Valentine's Day is a hard day. People who are married and their marriage is not what they had hoped or thought it would be, Valentine's Day is a hard day. Here's some things that we know about Eunice. Eunice was married to a man who didn't share her faith. Here's what the Bible tells us, that Timothy's mother was Jewish and a believer but his father was a Greek. So, so they didn't share their faith. And I wonder if that made for a lot of tension in their home. Here's something else we know. It's very possible that Eunice's husband had abandoned her at a young age or had maybe he was deceased because we don't read anywhere about his involvement in Timothy's life. So it could be that Eunice was a single mom. That's tough. I... I my friends who are single moms, my own mom is single mom. It's a tough, it's a tough thing. And I have the greatest respect for how you just have the courage to keep on persevering, keep on doing what you got to do. It's worthy of a lot of respect. It could be that that, that was you, Eunice's situation in life. Also this, Timothy, his mom was Jewish and his dad was Greek. It could be that that neither of those groups really accepted him. Timothy was not circumcised, which that would have been really hard for a Jewish mom because that was a big part of their culture. And he wasn't, was that because his dad wouldn't allow it? Or was that because the Jewish community said he's not one of us? We don't know. But it could be that Eunice dealt with that deep pain of having a child who's just not accepted, who just can't fi quite find their place in life. I think Valentine's Day would have been a hard day for Eunice. I think Valentine's Day probably wasn't the only 
hard day for her. But she was known for her sincere faith that lived and influenced her life. That's a beautiful thing. When you're in tough circumstances, when you're stressed, and yet your sincere faith lives and is evident to the people around. Sometimes it's the little things that are the great things. It's a noble thing to get out of bed in the morning, face another day, seek to love the Lord and the people around you. That's a noble thing. That takes a lot of courage. You know, um, last month we said goodbye for a little while to my mother-in-law. A lot of you knew her. And she, at the age of 86, she, um, in her words, she got to go be with her best friend. That's what she wanted. Um, it was interesting. A lot of people have shared memories with us of what my mother-in-law meant to them, and that's been really special. And my sister-in-law was kind of reflecting on some of the things that people have told us. And here's what my sister-in-law wrote. She said, it's interesting how various ones mention some particular moment or memory which inspires me to be a blessing even in the smallest task on very ordinary days. The smallest task on very ordinary days. Little things, but they make such a big difference. I'm curious, what are some of the things that come to your mind when you think of little things that you do on an ordinary day, but that might make a big difference? You're going to have a chance to talk about that at your tables in a little bit. Here's some of the things that I thought about. How about this? Noticing a person who's alone or new or lonely or left out. Noticing that person and valuing them. It's a little thing. But what kind of a big impact does it have on that person? That's huge. Or this, choosing not to join in on gossip or criticism. It's a little thing. It has a big impact. I was at a, a funeral just last week. Actually, it was this week. <laughs> no, last week. Um, a real sweet woman from here at Grace. And I was really inspired by some things that were said about her. And two of the things that really stood out to me. Someone said she never had a mean word to say about anyone. I thought, wow. That's maybe seems like a little thing, but that was a big thing. And someone else said her faith was lived out in the way she forgave people. Little thing, maybe. Big impact. Here's another one. Focusing on what we do have instead of complaining about what we don't have. It's a little everyday, ordinary, mundane thing. But it's a big deal to the Lord when we're grateful and thankful. How about listening? Really listening to someone who's hurting and praying for that person and following up. Little thing, big impact. Speaking a word of encouragement, sending a note to affirm someone. Doing things that we want, don't want to do, but doing them with a good attitude. Prioritizing time with Jesus. Those ordinary, everyday things. A very wise friend sent me something last week, and she said, in fact, I said to her, how did you know what I was talking about at Latte? She sent me this little statement. Great occasions for serving God come seldom, but little ones surround us daily. Isn't that good? Thanks, Hazel. Great occasions for serving God come seldom, but little ones surround us daily. So true. So that's where integrity shows up, says Rick Warren. In the stuff that nobody sees, in the stuff behind the scenes, in the small, unseen, unspectacular choices of life where you do the right thing, even though nobody's ever going to see it. Small tasks on ordinary days, small, unseen, unspectacular choices, the little things matter. You got out of bed this morning. That matters. Grandma, mom, auntie, teacher, health care worker, co-worker, friend, daughter, niece, neighbor. When you live with integrity, you can have a profound influence on the people around you. You know, you hear those sayings like, more is caught than taught. Or the way we behave speaks more loudly than what we say we believe. When you live with integrity, 
when your faith is sincere and it lives in you and it bubbles up from the inside out, and you love God and you love people, that is so profound, especially in a world where people just crave love and, and crave to be seen and to be valued. It's huge. So how do we get there? How do we get there? We're going to look for wisdom in an unlikely place, okay? We're going to look to a country song. But I'm not going to sing it. I'm just going to read the words. Driving through town, just my boy and me with a happy meal in his booster seat, knowing that he couldn't have the toy till his nuggets were gone. Green traffic light turned straight to red. I hit my brakes and mumbled under my breath. His fries went a-flying and his orange drink covered his lap. Well, then, my four-year-old said a four-letter word that started with F, and I was concerned. So I said, son, now where did you learn to talk like that? And he said, been watching you, Dad. Ain't that cool? I'm your buckaroo. I want to be like you and eat all my food and grow as tall as you are. We got cowboy boots and camo pants. Yeah, we're just alike, ain't we, Dad? I want to do everything you do, so I've been watching you. Got back home, and I went to the barn. I bowed my head, and I prayed real hard. I said, Lord, please help me help my stupid self. Then this side of bedtime later that night, turning on my son's Scooby-Doo nightlight, he crawled out of bed, and he got down on his knees, and he closed his little eyes and folded his little hands and spoke to God like he was talking to a friend. And I said, son, now where'd you learn to pray like that? He said, I've been watching you, Dad. Ain't that cool? This is why I don't listen to country music, because it makes me teary. I'm your buckaroo. I want to be like you and eat all my food and grow as tall as you are. We like fixing things and holding mama's hands. Yeah, we're just alike, ain't we, Dad? I want to do everything you do. So I've been watching you. With tears in my eyes, I wrapped him in a hug, said, my little bear is growing up. And he said, but when I'm big, I'm still going to know what to do because I've been watching you, Dad. Ain't that cool? I'm your buckaroo, I want to be like you and eat all my food and grow as tall as you are. By then I'll be strong as Superman. We'll be just alike, hey, won't we, Dad? When I do everything you do, because I've been watching you. So here's my question. I don't know if they had country music back in Bible times. <laughs> but I think Timothy could have said that to his mom and his grandma, right? I've been watching you, Mom. I've been watching you, Grandma, and I want to be like you. I want to have a sincere faith that lives in me, like you have a sincere faith that lives in you, that bubbles over, that, that shows to the people around you. That's what I want to be. So who's saying that to you? Who's saying to you, Auntie, I'm watching you. Neighbor, I'm, I'm watching you. Coworker, I'm watching you. Teacher, I'm watching you. Mom, Grandma. There's something about you, something different, and I want to be like you, so I'm watching you. And then what about us? Who are we watching? Don't you want to be like Jesus? If we want to be like Jesus, we can watch him. We can study him. We can see how he does things. We can see how he values people. We can see how he spent time with his heavenly father. We can see how he loved the word of God and he, and, and he studied and he, he meditated on the word of God. We can watch him. And that's not all. We can invite him to come and, and, and live in us by his spirit and change us and, and make us more the women that he wants us to be, to lead us and, and to guide us. We can say to him, you know that prayer that we've talked about here at Latte where we just say, whatever Whatever, Lord, whatever you want to do in me, I'm all yours. I'm surrendered to you. That's when we lean into the purpose that God has made us for. The purpose that he's made us for, to be like Jesus. To be Jesus to the world around us. One last story as I close. When our Anna was in eighth grade, she decided she wanted to learn French. So she signed up for French in school. She took French in ninth grade, tenth grade, eleventh grade. She was going to take it in twelfth grade. But her school canceled French four, so she couldn't take it in 12th grade. So she had this idea. She went to the administration of the school, and she said, I really want to learn French. Can I do an independent study? 
So they said, okay. And so she did Rosetta Stone for credit in her senior year in high school. Then she went off to college, and the college where she went, they didn't have French there. But she said, I really want to learn French. So all through college, all four years, she studied French independently. She just, she just read and learned and studied. She graduated from college in May, and you know what she did? She moved to France. And she's an au pair there because she wants to be able to live and work in French. And, and so she's learning. She's getting better and better in French, and she's living most of life in French now. And, and it's really cool. So she'll tell us about, you know, all these conversations she has. And, Mom, I was really excited because I, I could watch the news last night and I understood everything they said and it was all in French. And I'm like, that's great. I can't imagine what that's like, but that's great. <laughs> um, and then she'll tell us these funny stories, you know. Oh, man, I used this wrong word and here's what happened. <laughs> and it was really funny. And, and those are great stories, too. <laughs> she's not perfect in French but she's becoming better and better and better and more fluent and more comfortable in French. And if you compare where she is now to where she was in eighth grade, man, I mean, it's a whole world of difference, right? She's, she's, she's grown like crazy. Becoming like Jesus is the very same way, right? The, the more time that we immerse ourselves with him, the more we get to know him, the more we study him, the more we watch him, the more fluent we become in living like him, in his spirit producing all these wonderful things in and through us. That comes from, from time spent with him. Last little thought. Living with integrity does not mean perfection. Anna has stories where she messes up in French, even though she's immersed herself and she's studied and she's grown and she's learned. And, and you and I, we're going to have times when we mess up. Living with integrity does not mean perfection, but it does mean that when we mess up, we're quick to humbly ask for forgiveness from the Lord and from people. And I can tell you this, I'm so thankful for the verse in the Bible that tells us that every morning, every morning, God's mercies are brand new. There's a fresh start every morning. And so I can say to God, oh, Lord, you told me that if I confess my sins, you're faithful and just to forgive me of my sins and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. And there's a fresh start. That's a beautiful thing. I don't know who Alan Watts is, but I like this thing that he said here. He said, you're under no obligation to be the same person you were five minutes ago. Isn't that great? And if you have a sincere faith that's living in you, can I tell you something? You are not going to be the same person you were five minutes ago because the Lord is transforming us, and that's a good thing. So what I'd like to do is pray for us, and then we'll do our memory verse, and then you'll have some time to talk around the table. So let's pray. Lord, I thank you for every single woman here tonight. I thank you that you know her and you know every detail about her life and you love her. You know where the hurts are. You know where the pain is. But Lord, you're right there. And you've promised that you'll never leave us. And so God, I pray that you'll make us like Lois and Eunice, women who have a sincere faith that lives in us, that bubbles over from us. That even when we're going through tough times and there's pressure and there's stress and we're hurting, that our faith is a beautiful thing. And so I pray that as there's conversation at the table tonight, that it will just be a real beautiful time of listening and loving each other well. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, would you say your memory verse with me? It'll be up on the screen here. You ready? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. All right. Oh, yeah, Joshua, 1-9. <laughs> Happy Valentine's Day. Thanks for being here. Have a great conversation.